Welcome to the American Nephrology Nurses Association's 50th Anniversary Podcast Series. In this commemorative series, past presidents and other leaders of the American Nephrology Nurses Association will provide a rich history of the association itself and of nephrology nursing as a specialty nursing profession. The American Nephrology Nurses Association's 50th Anniversary Podcast Series is brought to you by the Nephrology Nursing Journal, the official journal of the American Nephrology Nurses Association. We are honored to present this episode, and we hope you enjoy these invaluable and enlightening nephrology nursing recollections. Hi, my name is Beth Ulrich. I'm the editor of the Nephrology Nursing Journal and a past president of ANNA. Today it is my honor to interview Jerry Biddle, who served as president of ANNA from 1985 to 1986. Jerry, I want to thank you for talking with us today about nephrology nursing. Well, Beth, thank you. I'm privileged and honored to do so. Thank you. So let's start at the beginning of your nephrology nursing career. How did you become a nephrology nurse, and what did your first nephrology nursing job look like? After I graduated from nursing school in 1964, I first worked in emergency rooms and surgical intensive care units. But then in January of 1968, a friend, a physician friend, who was a first-year nephrology fellow at Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia, encouraged me to come work in their research dialysis unit. I soon came to understand that the need for a nurse was based on the fact that the entire staff had turned over because of an outbreak of hepatitis B, which was eventually traced to contaminated blood, which had been stored in refrigerators with staff food. Those were the days when large twin coils often had to be primed with blood and blood was often collected and stored post-treatment. Additionally, those were times when nobody wore gloves unless you were doing a sterile procedure. The dialysis unit became a research site for newly identified Australian antigen and studies from this and other outbreaks led to the development of universal precautions and the first anti-hepatitis measures. For me personally, my orientation physical for my first job in dialysis included receiving 10 cc's of gammaglobulin in each shift as a condition of employment. Great fun. So, Jerry, you talked about in some of the memories you did for our background information about getting to know Dr. Kolf and Dr. Scribner. Tell us about those experiences. Yes. You know, in the 60s and into the 80s, I was privileged, as were many of us who started out early in nephrology to attend not only the AANNT meetings, but also the ASAIO, the American Society for Artificial Internal Organs, and the American Society of Nephrology meetings. Growing up in the relatively new specialty of nephrology meant meeting with physician colleagues, sharing knowledge, learning from one another, and socializing together. Though I never worked clinically with either of those doctors, we were often in attendance at a meeting, and they were always approachable and appreciative of nurses and nursing. You could ask them anything you wanted. You could always stop and talk with them and get to know them. And once I had the pleasure of inviting Dr. Kolf to a small ESRD meeting in Park City. He was in his 80s at the time, but happily drove up from Salt Lake City to join us. There were a group of about 30 of us. And after his short presentation, he would just sit around the table and talk with so many of us, so willing to share thoughts and life experiences. And Dr. Scribner was the same, a lovely man who loved to travel. And I would often meet up with him at international venues. And he would never fail to call out to me from across the room, no matter what dignitary he was with. (laughs) These were both very unassuming most of the time. (laughs) approachable men who were happy to share their experiences and their knowledge with you. And at my annual meeting in New Orleans, with board consent, ANNA awarded both Drs. Kauf and Scribner lifetime memberships in ANNA. I speak about these doctors specifically, but for many of us old-timers, we were always in the company and learning from so many other nephrology leaders as well, such as Dr. Scribner, Dr. Oriopoulos, or Dr. Frank Gotch, and so many others. I think it was a real sign of the times, because I absolutely agree with you that we were all partnering together with physicians and technicians and nurses and trying to solve the problems of the day, and it was really a a wonderful learning environment. It absolutely was. There was so much camaraderie for that period Mm -hmm. of time. In your presidency or when you were on the board of ANNA, tell us a little bit about nephrology, nephrology nursing, and and ANNA at that time. 
Well, when I think back over that period of time, nephrology and nephrology nursing during the 80s was going through the throes of staff cutbacks, which were affected by the 1982 changes in reimbursement. Almost all of the nephrology nurses were working in end-stage therapies at the time, dialysis and transplant. There were no practice guidelines for dialysis adequacy or anemia management, nor requirements for staffing ratios or certification. And as a result, when funding cutbacks hit, dialysis administrators started cutting dialysis sessions per week and times per sessions to run more patients, and they began substituting unlicensed personnel for dialysis nurses. And all of these changes produced poor quality care throughout the United States. But by the end of the 80s, in the words of doctors Tom Parker and Alan Hull, who were active with the Kidney Foundation at the time, the clarion bell had been rung, and it was time for the United States to improve its care. And at that time, that's the time when the National Kidney Foundation, the ESRD Network Forum, and the Healthcare Financing Administration banded together to start to measure and improve care. And within ANNA, during the years surrounding my presidency, we made and instituted plans, formalized nephrology nursing into a specialty organization identified the necessary component parts of the specialty practice and how to go about getting it done. We reinstituted the position of a full-time education director, wrote the first scope of practice for nephrology nursing, hired an editor to develop and publish the first core curriculum, and we established the regional meetings titled Clinical Concerns, which were especially important because of the quality issues and established a pathway forward for the development of the new certification exam for nephrology nurses, much broader in scope than the dialysis nurses certification. All of this was extremely important for the time, and it took all of us, not just my presidency, but all of us who were in the presidency roles at the time to accomplish all of these things. And ANNA and I specifically faced several challenges during my presidency and as an ANNA officer. I served on the AANNT board for five years, four as national treasurer during the late 1970s. And during that time, AANNT almost went bankrupt due to changes in management contracts before we were rescued by the AA Genetti firm. We not only lost a lot of money, but members and member lists. It was terrible. And as treasurer, that's the worst thing you want to be at that time. And you, Beth, were a star in helping to rebuild our marketing efforts. And then during my presidency were the challenges concerning apartheid when I invited South African nephrology nurses to participate in ANNA's first international nephrology meeting in New York City. Transitioning back to an all-RN association was a continuing issue, and withdrawing endorsement of the bonnet exam were all challenges but becoming accepted by the Federation for Nursing Specialty Organizations and having ANNA finally recognized as a specialty practice was the biggest reward. So, Jerry, we had been talking about that things transition from one presidency to the other, and it takes a lot of presidents along the way for something major to happen in the association. And obviously we can't interview Janelle Parker, who was a friend to both of us, about certification, but you were president when you all started the conversations and Janelle was on the board on certification. Can you talk about why you thought having a certification exam for nephrology nursing was important? It was part of the entire picture of becoming a profession that we needed to be able to validate our learning, and certification was part of that picture, part of the scope, the entire scope of a professional practice. And Janelle, that was her main focus, and we were all there with her to support her and to make it happen. And there was a lot of controversy about the existing bonded exam the Board for Nephrology Examiner Nursing and Technology. That exam was for dialysis nursing and was never intended to be an examination for nephrology, the broad scope of nephrology. Even when I sat on the board of AANNT in the 1970s when Bonnet was first established, it was always recognized that it was the first step toward an eventual certification for nephrology nursing that would come later on. 
and Janelle, during her presidency, made it happen. And we all, I think at that time, understood that that was the final spoke in the wheel of making us a specialty organization, finishing the job of making us a complete specialty organization. It took a lot of work. And, oh, I, um, I recall it was a huge endeavor. Right. One of the things you did in nephrology nursing was look internationally at nephrology nursing, both during your time on the board and I think after. Can you talk a little bit about that work and its importance? My interest in international nephrology nursing started when I was first asked to give a lecture in 1981 in Japan, and that was an offshoot of having been on the board of AANNT. I was off the board in 81, for 81 to 83, I think it was, but I was invited to go to Japan and had a wonderful time. And then the next year, I participated in a people-to-people medical delegation to China, And that was a wonderful experience as well. And those were the seeds that were planted in me to keep going. (laughs) Then during my presidency, each year the presidents of ANNA and the European sister group, the European Dialysis Transplant Association, which is EDTNA, would exchange visits with each other's presidents at annual meetings, as I'm sure you know. (laughs) I think I got to go to Bruges to present at EDTNA after my presidency. Yeah. So I just love the diversity of experiences, the professionally and cultural diversity, and the challenges and the similarities. And no matter where you go in nephrology nursing, what you see and hear is differences, and yet you communicate in a similar language of nephrology nursing, and it all makes you come closer together. And I just love the international travel and the exposure to all of this and the many close friendships that I gained over the years. So I've led several delegations to Japan and to London over time, exchange programs, and then after my presidency, several other past presidents and I, along with presidents from other national organizations around the world, formed the World Foundation for Renal Care to teach renal health care workers in developing countries. And through this organization, we were able to help some local nurses start their own organizations. For instance, in Lima, Peru, and we did a lot of work with the International Society of Nephrology in Argentina and Brazil and with the South African Association. And then I was also able to be active with the International Federation of Kidney Foundations. And Dr. Joel Koppel invited the World Foundation for Renal Care to be one of its charter members in that group. That was very interesting. You've talked about some of the things you've done in your career since being president of ANNA. What other things have you done in your career since then? Well, after my term as president of ANNA, when you serve as the president of a national organization, you are introduced to many opportunities. You get to meet and interact with so many individuals in healthcare and in other occupations and in nephrology on so many levels. You know, you just get back so much more than you ever give in terms of service to an organization. At least that's been my experience. But after my presidency, I began working as a quality consultant to the ESRD Network of New York. And from that position, I began work as an expert consultant to the Healthcare Financing Administration, now CMS, and was assigned the Anemia Project which was the first national quality improvement project. And I later served on the first dialysis outcome quality and initiative guidelines committee, the DOCI, for the management of the anemia in the chronic renal failure patient, and then the development of the first set of performance measures for anemia management. But today I serve as board chairperson for a large five-star nursing home in the Rochester area, the Friendly Home. And I also serve on the board of directors for a very large children's center, the Hillside Children's Center in Rochester for developmentally disabled children. Before I ask you the last question, I just want to say that it was a privilege for me to have you serve on my board when I was president, and it was a privilege for me to serve on your board when you were president. And I was pleased to be able to pass the gavel to you when my presidency ended. I felt like the organization was in wonderful hands, and it was. And so, and Beth, we so we lived that. through we lived through very special times in nephrology and nephrology nursing. And I guess in my words are, I worry about the future of nephrology as I watch it expand and contract and 
response to what's happening in the, the changing world of medical preferences and practices today. Yes. And I hope that nephrology nursing can and will survive and grow and expand. I think it will through nurse practitioners, but that I worry about that our nurses in clinical practice and at the bedside will stand strong for their patients' safety and quality and for their own personal rights and status. And once again, it's been a privilege for me to serve with you, with all of the past presidents. We all miss Janelle, and uh, we do. We look forward to seeing you all together soon. Jerry, I want to thank you for your service and leadership as president of ANA and for allowing us to interview you. We very much appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. The American Nephrology Nurses Association's 50th Anniversary Podcast Series is brought to you by the Nephrology Nursing Journal, the official journal of the American Nephrology Nurses Association. This series is owned and produced by the American Nephrology Nurses Association, all rights reserved. No portion of this podcast may be used without written permission. For archived episodes of this podcast and to learn more about the American Nephrology Nurses Association, visit the association's website at annanurse.org. You can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play Music, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, our hosting site Spreaker, and other various podcast delivery services.